Ida B. Wells was an African-American journalist who led the anti-lynching crusade in the United States in the early 1890s. She went on to become an integral part in the early fight for African-American civil rights. And if this is the type of content that you enjoy, you can find more content like this at OneMikeHistory.com. Also, if you'd like to support the channel, you can do so in my Buy Me Coffee or my Patreon page in the description below. Also, please give us five stars on Apple Podcasts and go support the YouTube channel. But without further ado, let's get started. Born in Holly Springs, Mississippi, July 16th, 1862, Wells was the oldest daughter of James and Lizzie Wells. Ida was about three when the Civil War ended and slavery was abolished. Her father, James, had been trained as a carpenter and was able to support his family without becoming a sharecropper. Because of this, he was extremely self-sufficient determined and proud. Once the war ended, Wells' family became politically active in Reconstruction era politics and James became a trustee in Shaw College, now Russ College, a freedman school in her native Holly Springs, Mississippi. This instilled the importance of education in Wells. In 1887, when Wells was visiting her grandmother, she was informed of a yellow fever outbreak in Holly Springs, Mississippi. The disease took both her parents and her infant brother, and she was left to raise her siblings. She took a job as a teacher at a county school so she could keep the family together, and eventually she moved the entire family to Memphis, Tennessee, where she continued to work as an educator into the 1880s. When Reconstruction was over, the South started changing rapidly. Jim Crow was gradually constricting black people's rights and freedoms with the enforcement of segregation. Wells began to protest Jim Crow on a train ride between Memphis and her job as an educator in a rural school. May 4th, 1884, the train conductor of the Chesapeake, Ohio Railroad ordered Wells to give up her seat in the first class ladies car and move to the train's smoking car. Earlier in 1883, the United States Supreme Court had ruled against the Federal Civil Rights Act of 1875, which banned racial discrimination in public accommodations. This verdict supported rail companies who chose to segregate their passengers based on race. This day, Wells refused to give up her seat and move to the smoking car. She argued that she had purchased a first class ticket and the conductor and two other passengers had to physically remove Wells from the train. Wells would gain publicity in Memphis when she wrote a newspaper article in the living way a black church weekly about her treatment on the train. She would then go on to hire a lawyer and sue the Chesapeake, Ohio Railroad Company, and she won her case in December 24th, 1884, when a local circuit court judge granted her a $500 settlement. The railroad company would appeal to the Tennessee Supreme Court, which reversed the Euler Court's ruling in 1887. It concluded, we think that it's evident that the purpose of the defendant was in error to harass with view of this suit, and her persistence was not in good faith to obtain a comfortable seat for the short ride. The court ordered Wells to pay all court fees. In 1886, she lost her teaching job after criticisms of the conditions of Memphis schools. She had written a few articles in newspapers and decided to turn to journalism full time. She used the synonym Iola. Wells began to write editorials for black newspapers that challenged Jim Crow in the South. She also bought a share of a Memphis newspaper, The Free Speech and Headlight. She became the first female co-owner and editor of a black newspaper in the United States, and she used this to further her cause of African-American civil rights. A major turning point in Ida's life was in 1892 when her friend Thomas Moss, a Memphis letter carrier and grocer, was lynched after a confrontation with a rival white grocer. When the People's Grocery opened up in a mixed race neighborhood in Memphis called The Curve, it was an instant success. It was not only a grocery store, but it was a sense of pride. However, a man by the name of William Berry, who was the white grocer before the People's Grocery arrived, felt threatened by the store's presence. One day after a racially charged mob grew out of a fight between a black youth and a white youth who were playing marbles near Monster's Grocery. When the black youth won the fight, the white youth's father jumped in to defend his defeat. Before long, Calvin McDowell and Will Stewart, who both worked at the People's Grocery, came to the black youth's defense. As the fight went on, the crowd of whites and blacks gathered at the scene, picking sides based on race. During the melee, William Barrett identified Will Stewart as an assailant and gave Barrett the fuel he needed to make a case 
to the police against Moss and the People's Grocery. In the early morning hours, the sheriff and five deputized citizens rushed the back of the store and gunfire was exchanged with multiple people being wounded and Moss, Stewart and McDowell being arrested and jailed. Three days later, the downtown jail was stormed by 75 men. Moss Stewart and McDowell were all dragged out and taken to the nearby Chesapeake, Ohio rail yard. The three men would attempt to fight back, but eventually McDowell was shot first point blank with a shotgun. Will Stewart was then shot in the back of the neck. And lastly, Thomas Moss was asked if he had any last words. And he told them, tell my people to go west because there is no justice here. And he was shot and left in a pile of bushes with the other bodies. This violence prompted Wells to not only arm herself, but wrote editorials urging African-Americans to move out of Memphis for their safety. Wells wrote news articles decrying lynching of her friend and the wrongful deaths of African-Americans, putting her own life at risk. She spent two months traveling the South gathering information on other lynching incidents. During this time, the lynching has solidified itself as a terror campaign for white control in the South. Most often, black victims were accused of raping white women. Ida doubted this. She explained the charge was often made after a man had already been hanged or burned or shot. She thought that it was more likely that the victims had had a consensual relationship with the white woman or, like her friend Thomas Moss, were businessmen who threatened rival whites and had no connection with white women at all. Ida then wrote a series of anti-lynching editorials in the free speech paper, the last one suggesting that white women could find black men romantically appealing. Ida stated that the old threadbare lie that Negro men raped white women. If Southern men were not careful, the conclusion might be reached in which may be very damaging to the reputation of their women. This editorial pushed some of the city's white people over the edge. On May 25th, 1892, the Daily Commercial published a threat. The fact that the black scoundrel, Ida B. Wells, is allowed to live and utter such loathsome and repulsive calamities is a volume of the evidence of the wonderful patience of Southern whites. But we've had enough of it. The Evening Scimitar copied the story from that same day, but specified their threat. The patience under such circumstances is not a virtue. If Negroes themselves do not apply a remedy without delay, it would be the duty of those that she has attacked to tie the wretch up who utters these calamities to the stake in an intersection of Maine and Madison, branding them on the forehead with the hot iron and performing a surgical operation with a pair of tailor shears. Nice. A white mob would ransack the free speech office, destroy the building and its contents. Luckily, Wells had been traveling to New York at the time, but it was made very clear that she could not return to Memphis. They made threats against her friends and family. The train station was being watched for her to return and creditors took possession of the office and sold off the assets of the free speech. Wells would accept a job in New York and continue her anti-lynching campaign. From that point on, she lived in the North, mostly in Chicago, and would change her pen name to Exiled. On October 26, 1892, Wells would publish her research on lynching in a pamphlet called The Southern Horrors, Lynching Law in All Its Phases. Wells examined many of the accounts of lynching due to allegations of white rape, and she concluded that Southerners cried rape as an excuse to hide the real reasons for lynching black progress and threaten white Southerners for competition and the idea of enforcing blacks as a second class citizens in society. Wells recommended that black people arm themselves to defend themselves against such lynching. After greater research into lynching in 1895, Wells would publish The Red Record, which was a hundred page pamphlet in more detail describing lynching in the United States after the Emancipation Proclamation in 1863. It also covered the struggles of African Americans since the Civil War, where its primarily focus was on the alarming rates of lynching in the United States. 
Wells said that during Reconstruction, most Americans outside of the South did not realize the growing rate of violence against black people in the South. And Wells believed that during slavery, white people had not committed as many attacks because of the economic value of their slaves. But once the Civil War was ended, white people feared black people. In the majority of these areas, white people acted to control them or suppress them with violence. During the Reconstruction era, white people lynched black people as a part of a mob effort to suppress black political activity and reestablish white supremacy after the war. They feared Negro domination through voting rights and taking office. Wells noted that since slavery, tens of thousands of Negroes have been killed in cold blood through lynching without formality of judicial trial or legal execution. She urged African Americans in high risk areas to move away and protect their families. Wells gave 14 pages of statistics of crimes committed from 1892 to 1895. She included very graphic details of these lynchings and noted that data had been taken from articles by white correspondents in white bureaus and white newspapers. The Southern Horrors and the Red Record documentation of lynchings captured the attentions of Northerners who knew little about the lynching and violence that was happening in the South. Despite Wells' attempt to garner support from white America about lynching, she felt that a campaign would ultimately struggle to overcome the economic interests of that lynching. Whites had been using lynching as an instrument to maintain Southern social order and discourage black economic ventures. Ultimately, Wells concluded that appealing to reason and compassion would not succeed in gaining the criminalization of lynching by Southern whites. This led Wells to conclude that perhaps an armed resistance was the only way to defend against lynching. Wells would travel to Britain in her campaign against lynching in 1893 and again in 1894. Her and her supporters in America saw these tours as an opportunity to reach a larger audience with her anti-lynching campaign. And she found sympathetic audiences in Britain who were already shocked about reports of lynchings in America. She received significant press coverage in the British and the American press. Many American articles were hostile personal critiques rather than reports of her anti-lynching campaign. The New York Times even called her a slanderous, nasty-minded mulatress. Frederick Douglass even praised Wells' work and sometimes even gave her some financial support. When he died in 1895, Wells was at the height of her fame and some wanted Wells to be the new leader and voice of African-American civil rights. But many more were ambivalent or were against a woman taking the lead in black civil rights struggle. During this time, women were often not allowed to be leaders in the wider society. And African-Americans would eventually turn to Booker T. Washington and his rival W.E.B. Du Bois for new leadership because Wells being an African-American woman activist was simply too radical. Wells also had a role in the suffrage movement, and she linked this to her lifelong crusade against racism and violence and the discrimination of African-Americans. Her view of women's enfranchisement was purely political, like all suffragists. She believed that women had the right to vote, but she saw enfranchisement as a way for women to become more politically involved in their communities and use their right to vote to elect African-Americans regardless of gender, and influence politics and office and promote African-American civil rights. Wells and her strong ideals conflicted with the predominantly white suffrage organizations. She had a very public feud with Frances Willard, who was the first president of the Women's Christian Temperance Union. The Women's Christian Temperance Union was a predominantly white women's organization based on the call for temperance and sobriety. In 1893, when Wells was traveling to Britain on her lecture tour, Willard was also in Britain promoting temperance as well as suffrage for women. Wells called attention to lynching in the United States and Wells publicly discussed her issue with the fact that Willard was silent on the issue of lynching. Wells referred to an interview in her tour in the American South in which Willard blamed African-Americans for the defeat of temperance legislation that the colored race multiplies like locusts in Egypt and the grog shop is the center of their power. The safety of women, of children, and of the home is menaced by thousands of localities so that men do not go beyond the sight of their own roof tree. 
Wells would even dedicate a chapter in the Red Record to the different positions that she had with Willard. The chapter was titled Miss Willard's Attitude and condemned Willard for her rhetoric and her promotion of violence and other crimes against African-Americans. In 1909, she attended a conference for the creation of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. Although she was considered a founder of the NAACP, she initially was left off the NAACP's controlling committee. Wells later became a member of the organization's executive committee, however, was quickly disenchanted with the NAACP's white and elite black leadership for the lack of action, and she distanced herself from the organization, leading to her being excluded from the founders list. Later, W.B. Du Bois implied that Wells chose not to be included, but she would state in her autobiography that Wells believed that Du Bois deliberately excluded her from the list. She would continue to focus her work on black women's suffrage in the city of Chicago following the enactment of a new state law enabling parcel women's suffrage. The Illinois Presidential and Municipal Suffrage Bill of 1913 would give women the right to vote for presidential elections, mayor, alderman, and most local offices, but not governor, state representatives, or members of Congress. Illinois was the first state east of Mississippi to give women the right to vote. The prospect of even partial enfranchisement led Wells to organize the Alpha Suffrage Club in Chicago, January 30th of 1913. One of the most important black suffrage organizations in Chicago, the Alpha Suffrage Club was founded as a way to further voting rights for all women and to teach black women how to engage civil matters and to work to elect African-Americans to city offices. Also in 1913. The National American Women's Suffrage Organization was organizing a suffrage parade in Washington, D.C., marching on the day before the inauguration of Woodrow Wilson as president, and they were demanding universal suffrage. Wells, as president of the Alpha Suffrage Club, was invited to the march, but on the day of the march, the head of the Illinois delegation told Wells that delegates of the National Association for Women's Suffrage wanted to keep the delegation entirely white and that all black suffragists including wells had to walk at the end of the parade with the colored delegation instead of going to the back with the other african americans wells waited until the parade was underway and stepped into the illinois delegation as they passed by and she visibly linked arms with the other white suffragists with the rest of the parade wells would continue her work for decades in decrying lynching and african-american political causes during world war one the united states government placed wells under surveillance and labeled her as a race agitator in 1922 she supported an anti-lynching bill before congress that was ultimately defeated and with that all federal efforts to end lynching died in 1928, she would begin writing her autobiography, The Crusade for Justice. She was never able to finish the book because she died of kidney disease on March 25, 1931, at the age of 68. Her daughter, Alfreda Barrett Duster, would edit and publish her autobiography in 1970. In 2020, Ida B. Wells was awarded the Pulitzer Prize for her outstanding and courageous reporting of the horrific and vicious violence against African Americans during the era of lynching. Thank you. This has been One Mic History. I'm your host, Country Boy. If you like more stories like this, you can find more stories like this at OneMicHistory.com. Also, if you'd like to support the channel, you can do so at my Buy Me Coffee or my Patreon linked in the description below. Also, please give us five stars on Apple Podcasts and support the YouTube channel. Peace.